So hello everyone, my name is Katie Bradford Osborne. I'm the founder and curator at Roaring Artist Gallery. We're a fully virtual art gallery who exhibits exclusively the work of women identifying and non-binary artists. And we are here today for the very first of our series of artist talks for our Awakening in Fear exhibition. And oh, I love artist talks so much. I think this is gonna be a really wonderful one. So. First, we have Melanie Jordan. And Melanie, I'm gonna read just a little, a little snippet of your um, the bio part of your things. I don't wanna go into what I know you're gonna yeah. be talking about, but I'll start there and then I'll hand it over to you. All right. Okay, these are in Melanie's words. I trained and worked as a primary teacher early in my career on in my career before motherhood took over and I took time to raise my family. I returned to work as a teaching assistant and supply teacher part time before I took the plunge and embarked on an access course in art and design. I haven't looked back, gaining a BA followed by an MA in fine art. My children are in their 20s now, but my son is autistic, so I still is still dependent on me for support. My artwork has gradually focused in on this, paying attention to how it feels to have a need to be the nurturer, but feeling trapped by the responsibility of motherhood. That is maternal ambivalence. All right, Melanie, I'm gonna pass it over to you and I'm looking yeah. forward to it. <laughs> right, so I'm going to, um, uh, hello everybody. <laughs> nice uh, nice to see you. As, um, as Katie said, I'm based in the UK and um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen. I've got a presentation, so I'm just going to be, this for me is always the worst, the worst part. <laughs> Hopefully I have it kind of um, ready. Can you see it? Hopefully you can. <laughs> um, so um, my name is Melanie, Melanie Jordan, or Mel, if people call me Mel, and I'm, um, based in the UK, in Kent actually, which is right down in the south, just below London. Um, and my children are now grown up uh, in their twenties. And um, I was a primary teacher, but um, I don't really teach anymore. Um, but my artwork has really kind of gradually kind of um, focused in on motherhood, on the topic of motherhood. And it kind of pays attention to um, maternal ambivalence. Now this is really the, the tension of motherhood between the kind of needing to nurture um, and feeling trapped. You know, if you think back, if you, if you have children um, to when your children were little and that feeling of, you know, when they won't stop crying or whatever and you really want to scream. Um, well, that, that's the kind of, you, you really want to care for them, but that kind of ambivalence, that feeling of being sort of trapped by the, the responsibilities and um, of somebody really needing you. And so my, my artwork has really tries to shine a light on this maternal ambivalence. And because I am um, a mother of, a, of an autistic adult, um, my son is now 24, then this kind of gives a slightly different um, slant on things. Normally, um, in the scheme of things, <laughs> you have your children and they kind of grow up and gradually they go on to independence and then a sort of, sort of bond between mother and child gets gradually sort of broken and you know, they go on to be independent and you gain a, a independence, I guess, as well. Um, but when you have a child, that's still dependent on you into adulthood, which um, my son is. Um, although he's very articulate, he's actually got a degree in animation and illustration. Still, um, there's he's dependent on me for um, kind of being that person that sort of sorts him out. Um, you know, sometimes you have a meltdown, that kind of thing. So, um, so that means that the kind of the gut that the, the the road to independence is kind of stuck and it's stuck in that dependent phase. And that's really what my artwork for the last few years has focused on. I'm gonna see if I can move on um, to the next slide. Um, it should be, it should be, it's a little bit down there, but it isn't. So how do we move on? I think we just do that. Oh yeah, there we are, there we are. Sorry about that. Right. <laughs> and my actual artwork is very haptic and um, tactile, sort of touchy-feely. And 
with sort of thread based crafts really form the core of it. This is actually um, this is the, the beginning of my artist statement. They actually hand stitched um, as part of my MA. And I quite like the to leave the threads loose. A lot of my work has this kind of and I, I did a lot of um, stitched text and um, with the kind of threads um, hanging down. So just going to move on to the next one now. I'm going to show you a little a little clip of a performance that I did. Um, I said that my son is autistic, um, but he is very articulate and he really likes to, to talk. And um, one of the things we often have conversations, you think, well, that's really great, but actually the conversations are very, can be very repetitive and um, tedious really. But because of the way that I am, I'm very sort of mumsy and supportive, then, um, I kind of get trapped in the conversations, the same conversations again and again. And quite often they're about um, a group of elderly um, gentlemen that he met while volunteering in Oxfam, which is a charity shop in the UK. And um, he's actually built, he gets on really well with them. And they, they actually, last night they went um, out for an evening. He went out with a couple of them. So he gets on really well with them, but they're often the topic of conversation and it'll be all oh, my friend Frank and um, he'll tell you the same thing. And there are, you know, I could tell you an awful lot of things about Frank. You know, I know that Frank got married in Iran. Um, I know if I thought about it, I could tell you when Frank's birthday is. I know he's got a wife called Annie and, um, you know, lots of other things um, that really, I said that I've never met Frank, <laughs> but because I've had these same conversations, then I, I you know, these, these facts, I sort of, you get, they're, they're very, um, you feel trapped in them because they're the same conversation but yeah oh yes okay right oh that's very interesting whereas actually you really want to scream and this piece is actually um was inspired by a performance by an artist called Francois Janico who um was a French um, performance artist um and it's trying to get the idea of what it feels like to be sort of having this conversation but um being trapped in it and it's just a very short bit because it's actually it went on for about four minutes I thought and you, you really do get the idea that's very tedious so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna show you a little bit these are just some of the facts about um this elderly gentleman always oh, very short actually but um, it gives you an idea that these conversations um, can make you feel like you're, you know, you're, you're kind of really trapped. And um, we collected together, Tom and I, who he quite enjoyed doing, we collected all the facts. I made a Frank book, we collected all the facts and um, sort of I wanted to do something with them. And I made this head. This is this kind of generic head. And this head which actually hangs from the ceiling. It's been in quite a few exhibitions and you can have the idea is you can actually look into to it because it's filled with lots and lots of facts about Frank. And the idea is, and I'll just um, move on to the next one. You can actually see it. It's all filled with these. They're, they're this machine embroidery. All these facts about Frank, um, like when he was married, that he honeymooned in Iran, that he's got... Um, a son called Paul and a daughter called Sally. And, and, and if I thought about it, I'd probably tell you their birthdays. And the idea is that people can look into it and you, you get a feeling of they're really up close, too close really to read. So you get a feeling of how they can feel as if they're very claustrophobic. So, um, so this was sort of me playing about with the, these conversations. I found that actually the art has been a really good way of sort of um, processing all this um, uh, th thoughts about, you know, the way I feel, I guess. Um, so still, so, thinking about all these words and please stop me if I'm going on because I can't actually see what the time is now so just cut me off if I've gone on too long but because of all of these conversations I started to think about them and that actually the bit that I really relished in the conversations was the pauses the brief kind of lull in the conversation where um you know Tom would take a breath so oh, I shouldn't probably shouldn't have said his name but anyway and I started to see them as a space for myself and I started to think of words. I started to write words from my thoughts and feelings to go in the spaces, you know, the pauses. So I was like owning the spaces, kind of like redressing the balance in a way. And I started to stitch them into these ribbons of words, um, kind of spools of thought. So um, 
they're quite personal. I didn't, um, but they're, they're, I've got about 15 of them. Um, but what do you do with them? <laughs> I, did, I don't know, I didn't know whether I really wanted people to read them because they're quite personal. So um, I made these bodily bobbins to display them. Um, <laughs> my daughter thinks they're, you know, particular, they're nothing to do with penises or anything. They're actually, they're, they're, they're supposed to be, they're called the hands of the, um, the hand of the, the troops of maternal concern and they're sort of supposed to be like a supportive kind of hands um, of a mother um, you know that always comes to the rescue um, when things go a bit pear-shaped and so that's really what they what they represent and they kind of they display the words the ribbons of words um, in a way that you can see glimpses of meaning but you can't you can't read them all so so it was a case of how much do I want people to read or and so that's that's kind of um and I'll show you I've got some more um yeah these are some more pictures of them really when they were when they were displayed um as you can see you can see some of the the words so so you get a kind of a feel of the essence of it but not the whole words um so starts it next um, so here they are, the troops of maternal concern, and this is a kind of installation I did uh, of all of the work that I did around this at that time. Um, it was during the lockdown, so we couldn't have an exhibition or anything. So this is in a barn in, in my home. And um, so this, these are the troops of maternal concern. And then on the floor um, in the lockdown, um, as part of my work, I was sort of dyeing, doing lots of dyeing with avocado stones and seeds. And this, all this color is from the avocado and um, this sort of experiments that I did. And I had loads of pieces and in the lockdown, it, obviously you can imagine that, you know, all the tensions are kind of um, amplified. So um, I don't really know why I started to do it, but I started to stitch these pieces together, just sit on the floor and stitch them. And I actually found it was a really good, even though I'd been thinking about all these words, this is called emotional silence. And I kind of felt that actually it was the silences that were important. So um, I was stitching all this together and it was as if somehow, you know, when I was stitching it, the words are stitched in, or, you know, you know, you don't, you, you don't know them, but they're th my thoughts and feelings. So um, it, it was quite a, quite profound really, because I, it, the, um, you know, because it was at a time um, so, so that's that, and that's that installed. Um, this is um, this is called pin cushion, obviously. That's the idea of pin cushion. And the idea of this one is that the sort of ambivalence, thoughts, and feelings are piercing out <laughs> from the sort of private in inside into the outside. And I think that's a really good thing. Um, that's something that my artists kind of helped me to do, really, to, to um, you know, rather than all those feelings are inside, to sort of own them. And, and actually, that's OK. You know, it's OK to feel like that. Um, so, so that's and this is, again, made with the avocado dyed fabric. Um, this is the, the emotional silence piece. It was huge. It, it, um, I, I did it actually in my garden room. I used to sit on it and stitch it. And I actually found it really cathartic. Um, and again, that's that's it outside. So that's that one now. <laughs> that was kind of uh, the end of a slightly. I had a bit of a pause there. And um, the next kind of um, part of my work, I started to think about this as a placenta. <laughs> um, it's about a meter wide. I've got two of them. Um, thinking about the placenta as being the kind of the, the, the link between mother and child. So maybe that was the root of where things um need I needed to go back to the beginning and um and so I started to to make these these percent of this one here the one in the window is actually in Berlin that one so it went to be into all the way to Berlin and um back again so um and this is just just a little kind of this is one that was this is was down in in Folkestone but this gives you a little bit of an idea of how a bit large it is really but I made it with felting it's made of felted wool um, in fact, the wool that's sort of stitched on the top was actually hand spun as well. So um, that was in a previous, quite often reused things that I've made. So that's that. Um, and just wanted to show you, this is the piece it's called that was in the exhibition. Um, and that this is cut the umbilical, this. Um, there are actually three of them. This is the first one. This is the one that's in the exhibition. 
um, and I've got um, another two. There's a cut the umbilical two and cut the leg on three. And um, this you can see here that they're, they're hand stitched. They're, they've got a wire armature, but they're actually hand stitched with some of the scraps of avocado dyed fabric. Um, and the idea is that, um, you know, you want to break that umbilical bond. There's a feeling that you want to, to, to kind of break it and be free of it. Um, but obviously they're soft scissors. So the kind of idea is that they're not really going to be a lot of use. So that's slightly ironic that, you know, you're, you're making scissors that, you know, that, so it's like, do, do you want it to cut it or not? Um, so that's kind of, um, yeah, that's that. So, so I just got a, f a few um, that, uh, and this is a little bit to show you the, the process. Um, this is the, the the dyeing the fabric. A lot of the fabric, it's I don't get new fabric. It's all either from charity shop or people give it to me or um, you know old clothes that kind of thing. Uh, it's mostly cotton or linen or because that takes to dye better. Um, I find and I find I'm, I do a, I like a mord, mordant first um, and that that sort of seals the material and then it takes the dye and it doesn't fade otherwise if you use something like avocado dye um, it would just in time it would fade so that's the idea and this is this is one of them um, sort of in production in production really and the one on um, this side this is not the one that's in the exhibition this is uh, a, another one that um, and this one, this is the last one, <laughs> this is the three, the three, cut the umbilicals. And um, I kind of like this picture because, um, because my work is sort of really all about sort of motherhood and the feelings um, and tension of motherhood. But this, when I made these, I didn't think the idea behind it wasn't, but when I put them down, they looked like, I don't know if you, if you have children and you can remember back when they were little and you went to sort of mother and baby groups and, you know, everyone put the baby down on the mat sort of thing. And, you know, often mothers would sit around and the babies would there on the mat and it kind of reminded me, they, they, they look almost like children, <laughs> the babies, that's kind of what I think. But this, this is a series and I am actually, um, sort of making more of them and I'm also that my, my latest um, I haven't got a picture of it but my latest um, creation is I, I've got this sort of I'm making a trying to make the scissors almost it, it as a glove like part of a sort of like a hand so that it can actually um, so I, I, I don't know might use it for a performance or um, a, a sort of video or something so that's that's what I'm doing at the moment so that's um, and I can, that's, that's all of my, um, my slides. I'm going to, to stop that now. And I don't know how, quite how, how far. Oh, yes, yeah, about 20 past. So that's about right, isn't it? That's not too bad. <laughs> so that's, that's my presentation anyway. So um, there you are. There. Thank you so much, Melanie. That was absolutely wonderful to see more of your work. Melanie is actually the first runner up for Best of Show. I saw that. I know. It's the best in that sounds like, yeah, that's very exciting. Well, <laughs> I've never had a runner up for best in show before. So it's quite exciting. That's that's awesome. I got to choose that one actually. Oh, and, right. Oh, thank uh, you very much then. Thank you. <laughs> very honored. Thank you. <laughs> and one of the reasons I chose it is because, well, I was thinking of this particular show is about women's rights. It's about people who are um, using their art for their voices for these issues of women's rights and issues of motherhood are forever going to be intertwined in that. Um, it's something that comes up again and again in our gallery. And I thought this was such a fantastic take on those feelings that maternal ambivalence, like you're mentioning, um, this was such a, a fantastic way to bring that out into the world, these feelings that you have and say, this is okay, because I know you're not the only one who, who experiences no, that. No, it's very really common. So it, it's, um, but it's kind of a bit taboo really, I, I guess, especially, you know, it seems, um, you know, even uh, it took me a long time actually to kind of feel comfortable about talking about it, <laughs> you know, cause it feels, very disloyal because you know I love I love my children very much so it's not you know and I think that's uh, it, that ju just because you feel like that doesn't mean that you love them any less you know so I think it's quite a you know 
it's perhaps a, a difficult thing to talk about so that's why mm -hmm. I feel it's quite important well that was I'm I'm very glad that you are and I'm so glad to have this piece in our show oh, does well, anyone have great. any questions or comments I think I have a I have a question. Um, I'm I'm really interested in the stitched text that you uh, were oh, showing. Yeah. Oh, okay. The yeah. Strands that were coming down, and um, I could I could see with all the hand stitching that you've done with these um, with these avocado dyed objects um, that there's you know there's a thread that goes through. I mean, quite quite literally. But and I'm wondering if you're thinking about pairing the text at all with anything that has more dimension, really. I mean, I, I could see it on that spool, uh, or not the spool, but the, the maternal hand that you were talking about that, that helps kind of guide. Um, but I would love to see it, you know, dimensionally. And I'm wondering if that's some, like, if you're, if you're done with the text or if you're going to implement it further. And yeah, it's, I've hand. kind of, it's, um, I must admit, I've gone a bit off of the text. Um, mm. I was very, very into it. And the, um, as I said, the head is, is all lined. Um, you know, that's all lined with, with text. So I was quite, and I quite liked the idea of it kind of being quite sculptural. Mm -hmm. I, I did experiment with kind of just, <laughs> just having the text that I, I stitched onto like a disappearing kind of membrane. And, and uh -huh. then, uh, but <laughs> it, it kind of, it kind of worked, but it didn't, it sort of shriveled up a bit, but, but, um, but I, I probably will come back to the text because I do, I do like, I do like it. And I do think it's quite, especially, um, I really, really like the way um, that it kind of, the, the threads, you know, you've got the loose threads, so it's almost like slightly unraveling. Mm. Um, so so definitely I, I do like the, the text. Um, as, as I said, I've sort of, I, I tend to do that. I sort of do so down one avenue and then I kind of pause and mm. then I kind of sort of go off in a slightly different tangent. Mm. Um, but I definitely think the text is something that I'll sort of come sort of back to. I think it's sort of, I need, um, it's what it what the text is is you know when I've got something to, to to actually say in the words then then it goes into to be stitched if you see what I mean mm -hmm. um so you know because I that um the first thing that I did was like Frank's the, the gentleman's words um and then I sort of had my own words so I'm not sure you know or maybe you know I'm I'm that there's something will come to me and then that will be what what I'm saying so you know I did I did something else actually with somebody who which is very interesting who's adopted he was adopted he's uh he's 65 now but he was a he was adopted and he was he was a foundling um I don't know if you have that term in in, in America where you're sort of left by a telephone box and um and he had a letter that was written by his mother that his mother wrote and it was quite it had a lot of um is sort of ambivalence in it in fact more um you know not much love to be honest mm -hmm. and he had this letter and he actually let me have the letter um, which is quite interesting and um I kind of I I, I did some stitching of the, the words from that picking out some of the words it, mm -hmm. I felt um because it was somebody else's very important thing you know that was a, it's slightly difficult but um I did find that was really um, interesting to explore, you know, how that kind of um, sense of motherhood, another take on motherhood, really. So, so I kind of wait until something, you know, that feels juicy <laughs> comes along. But, yeah. Thank you. Melanie, I love, I mean, I'm so drawn with your work, um, just drawn into it and have so many relatable um, themes that I work with as well. So it's just, it's really, it's really stunning and really like soft and quiet. Um, I'm wondering about the scale of the scissors and are you thinking about, I mean, because well, kind of like the biomorphic like nature of them, like, yes, I once yeah. see like babies, I'm like, oh, those are chubby little baby arms. <laughs> yes, they are. Um, yeah, I, I could. I would love to make. Room. I would love to make. You know, large ones. I do tend to find that size-wise, um, I, I kind of revert to type. <laughs> you know, I kind of find that sort of sm small, objecty size um, 
uh, whether I don't know why whether that's because it's ease of, of doing or whether that's the size that I uh, I don't know really but um you know I would love to make I went to a, a, an exhibition that was down in it was at the we have the the Turner Contemporary which is in Margate in Kent if you've heard of it and um, they have the, the Turner Prize, which is like in Britain, it's a big kind of contemporary art prize. And they had it in Margate. And one of the people was, she was called uh, Tai Shani was her name. And she does a lot of sort of um, quite feminist art. And she had these great big pink kind of sculptural things. And um, that's where I got my, the idea of my bobbins was inspired by. She had these great big pink shapes that was all in and, um, and I can imagine in an ideal world, I'd love to see my scissors like filling, you know, filling a gallery like that. But um, <laughs> so the logistics and all that. So yeah, but yeah, no, that would that would be great. One day, one day. <laughs> yeah. That would be awesome. I would love to see that. Yeah, maybe, and especially, I, I really, because I, I quite like work when you can actually touch and not that precious to be honest about my work and I like quite like you can imagine if people could actually kind of sit on them or you know that is sort of thing so we'll see <laughs> maybe one day watch this space so. that's awesome Amy said thank you Melanie for sharing that motherhood inspires your imagery I find it wonderful that thread work is a major medium being used by so many contemporary women globally I love that too. I've spoken about that quite a few different times, but I feel like in a lot of ways, um, take, you know, like using sewing and things like that for, for making these kinds of statements in a lot of ways, taking back our history as artists, as women, because we've been doing this for ages and we had something to say ages ago too. And it was, um, yeah, I think also so people were, were saying it through the stitching. I mm -hmm. went to a I went to an exhibition. It was at the Turner again because that's our local gallery. But they had it was they had some um, it was a lot of women women artists from the south of America, you know, in the south of Georgia and Alabama and that area. And they had some of the quilts that they actually made, and they made them with a real scraps of and you know you could see when you saw them, you know, they, some of them were a bit grubby. And I think that's because that's where the you know they they did them at like you know in a really long day you know they fitted them in between and the whole of that like their essence of of their life was stitched into these um quilts I did find that that really um, inspiring. when Kelly said was it G's Bend the G's Bend artists it could well have been yeah I can't remember it was it was I just before it, the yeah. lockdown and it, it got closed but it was it was it was amazing yeah Oh, right. Oh, okay. A vintage G's Ben piece. Oh, and it was one of my yeah. prized possessions in oh, my, my personal yeah. art. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, that's so wonderful. I love that that it, that it is in England too. And yeah, yeah. It's good. I've yeah. only ever seen it in America. The, um, one of the very first times that I ever really explored women's rights in art was in Philadelphia. The, the Philadelphia Museum of Art had a G's Bend um, exhibition. This was back, I don't know, 12 years ago, maybe, you know, probably longer than that. And it was so fascinating to see. And it really opened my eyes to so many things at that time. I'm from the American South myself. Oh, okay. And, yeah. um, yeah, that was, that was just, that was one of those times that um, changed my life. Art completely changed my, the way I was looking at things and um, transformation all there. That's a good word. And um, I love seeing the different ways that people are doing it. So I love that you're doing this. It was really cool to hear more about the sustainability in your art as well that's that's really fascinating what you're doing with that as well oh, thanks I don't really talk about that much actually I just kind of do it <laughs> <laughs> well that's that's part of what makes yeah. it yes yeah. well does anyone else have any questions or comments before we move forward well thank okay. you thank you so thank much you very for much for listening to that. thank you very it's much for wonderful. giving me the opportunity thank you thank you all right our next artist that we have up let me pull up um is Kelly Marshall. Um, Kelly, I realized today that at this time last year, we actually had you in our gallery for the personal protective show. She it was a solo exhibition that was really cool. And um, this is a very different side of your work 
that we have now in this exhibition. And I absolutely love this series. So I'm excited to hear more about it. Um, okay. Kelly Marshall, born and raised in San Diego, California, now resides in Seattle, Washington with her family. She holds an MFA from Pacific Northwest College of Art and a Master of Special Education from National University. Marshall is a founding memory, or a, a founding member <laughs> of the, uh, do you pronounce it Art Ma? Is that right? Okay. Yeah. Awesome. The Art Ma Collective in Seattle, Washington. All right, I'm not gonna read the rest because I know that these are things that you'll touch on and I'm gonna hand it over to you. All right. Okay. Um, and Kelly Marshall, and I am a conceptual research-based artist um, recently out of Seattle, Washington, but most of my life has been in um, Southern California. Um, I have two teen boys, and I am an administrator at a creative and performing arts middle and high school in Seattle. So I have my I have my BA in painting and printmaking and my master's of special education and I just graduated with my MFA this past summer um, from Pacific Northwest College of Art in Portland. And today during this talk I'm essentially going to share my personal journey toward finding my artistic voice, which correlates directly with the show's theme of awakening and Fuhrer, because it's essentially my own awakening as an artist. So. In the spring of 2020, I decided, like, I finally gave myself permission to do the one thing I never believed I could do, and that was to go and get my MFA. Prior to that, I had a pretty safe, quote unquote, safe painting practice, um, and I was just really interested in investing in myself as an artist and figuring out how I can make work about the things that I care about, not just things that look nice to me. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I just felt like I had more to say and how could I make those two things work together in a in an art practice. I really wanted to make it wanted the work to convey my experience and the greater experience of being a girl or a woman in this country during this time feeling invisible. So I started pushing myself with materials and process letting go of my inherent need for beauty um, and really challenging myself to get the work off the canvas, um, you know, with my concepts and research and, you know, how can I make that, make the work really evoke a feeling. Um, this piece, as an example, is a visual expression of the utter neglect of a woman's body, my own body, post-childbirth. Um, it's an expression of our medical system's disregard for women's health in the childbirth experience via my own experience. It's called Pleasure Stitch. And it has, it's made, it has sewing patterns and lace and cancer, gynecological cancer studies and thread and all sorts of things on it as, in, in addition to paint and dry media. So as I was working and going through this program and this process, which is really about, you know, like really defining my own identity, um, I started trying to get bolder with my materials and thinking what, about whether or not my painting was getting me to the place I wanted to be. And what I discovered was that it was a direct, so was it, you know, I'm asking questions, is it direct enough? And what I discovered is that it was really difficult to let go of my ideas of what my art making should be. I needed to go deeper. I needed to be more personal. I needed to tell my own story. And so I started experimenting. Um, this piece called Evil Eye is in a series of painting, mixed media paintings um, called Mom Jeans. So I really experimented a lot. This is another piece made out of doilies that um, was part of this experimental process. And this time um, I made this at the Stay Home Gallery residency and it's called Room Tight. So I started taking anecdotes, you know, my stories, some funny, some sad, 
some whimsical, some a little traumatic, and I began to give them life and form. This piece, as an example, is the time is taken from a time where my older sister, um, who was maybe six at the time, convinced me that in order to protect myself from the monsters under the bed, that I needed to put a tack in my mouth, that that would that would be the thing that protected me. And we shared a room <laughs> and, um, you know, so I'm thinking about like layers of meaning and then what it meant for me and really what it meant for my family, because of course I swallowed the tack and our family did not have health insurance. And that, what did that trip to the ER mean to my family? And what does that mean? I mean, really just like what does it mean to grow up in this, in this country in, you know, with this sort of, you know, the failed concept, the flawed concept of an American dream when, you know, you don't always have enough. So I started taking my ideas of painting and thinking larger. And this is an example as a first attempt at a site specific installation. Um, and I'm trying to take that concept into a room like into a whole room and thinking about actually curating a space as a part of my practice. How can I evoke feeling? How can I use the entire space um, to do this thing that I'm you know, wanting to convey? So again, as I'm moving forward, the work is becoming more direct. I'm taking things from other pieces and transforming them into new work. Um, and then deconstructing them again and again, it's getting a lot looser and it's also getting more conceptual. Um, again, using space to elicit feelings. The piece, this is from a group show um, that was last fall. Um, and the, my piece is the yellow house, the yellow playhouse in the, in the background. Um, it's floating a few inches off the ground and I consider it sort of a three-dimensional line drawing and it's made out of the same material as my favorite childhood t-shirt. It's this knit roving um, and I'm thinking, and for me, I'm thinking about that fine line between the whimsy of childhood and also that precarity of growing up in poverty, um, you know, which is the case of so many girls and children in this country. Um, and as an aside, um, for about 10 years, I owned and operated a children's art school and it was full inclusion. My background is in special education. Um, and one of the things that I loved in my program is how we experimented with materials and finding ways for all kids to access art. And so this particular material, this like big chunky knit, um, knit roving was a way that I could work with children with fine motor disabilities um, and give them access to acts like knitting um, and weaving, you know, using this modified, in our case, it was, you know, like you modify the materials, you make it more accessible. And so it was really exciting to sort of take the things that I was doing in my professional life and bring them into my artistic life. So I'm continuing working and moving further and further away from painting in many ways. Um, and I'm exploring themes of labor and care and how it relates to women and girls through the experiences of myself, my sisters, and my mother. Um, this is a series of monotype prints made from um, the pattern of flatware that my mother would she'd collect the the Betty Crocker UPC codes on the boxes, sort of like the box tops, and um, you could send away for place settings of flatware of Oneida flatware, and this was her pattern. Here's another piece um, where I'm thinking again in this world we live in, where labor is inequitably distributed, how we survive when we don't have enough. And also the concept around spoons in um, conversations about disability, which was highly personal to my family and my mother as a person who's visually impaired. Um, and so these, these are needle felted spoons um, and I, the title of them is Stir and Spank. Um, and I have about, I think there's about 
30 of them in this pile and they're made from unbleached needle felted wool. And again, I'm looking at how women and girls survive in these conditions of scarcity. And this is a photo from, it's actually from my thesis exhibition, this, these last few slides um, where I have just various pieces that are thinking about that concept. Um, this is probably my favorite piece from the exhibition. Um, again, moving so far away from painting, um, these are kites made out of underwear. And um, I, I was thinking about, okay, how can I take something, uh, taking a story, again, giving life to these memories, um, taking the story from my childhood of shame, but it's not sexualized. And so that's how I landed on kites. Um, and again, it's, you know, the moments of whimsy and resilience. So here's some of the new work that I'm working on right now. I have a solo exhibition coming up um, and it's actually one year from now. Um, and I will be making, um, uh, these are paintings, prints and large, large scale soft sculpture. Um, and it's called, comp it's the series called Compound Fracture. And it relates back to, um, <laughs> it's a story where I fell, I fell off a slide and I had a very serious injury. Um, and there are a lot of like funny anecdotes and also sad things that happened, but um, I, it was just a jumping off point. And that's where all of these memories um, are leading me to is just a way to enter into my art practice um, by giving material form to these memories. And this is where I land on the work that's in the show. So this is a, this is a, essentially these are documentation of a performance. These are artifacts. Um, it's a series of Polaroid photos of um, a performance I did call, and it's called Grand's Lipstick. Giving material form to that memory again, using this form of documentation that is, you know, in it, quoting, quoting Hito sterile um, without, <laughs> without having the exact reference, but the poor image. Um, and I'm excited to see how using things like a Polaroid can change an experience. So I started experimenting with art performance, which is not something I've ever done or really felt comfortable with is how to place myself in the center of my work. Um, and you literally using my own body. It's terrifying. And it's also challenging because I have to determine how to take these thing that's highly personable and make it relatable to others at large. So in this artifact, I'm reenacting a childhood performance of coloring my own body as, as a baby with my grandmother's red Chanel lipstick. I'm interested in discovering what happened, you know, so at the time, like what, well, what's going to happen if I do this with my adult woman's body with this lipstick, how does it change the intention? How does it change the meaning and what is going to be the reaction to the work? I didn't know what the results would be. And I honestly hadn't, you know, the concept relating to the work in this particular show hadn't quite been actualized at the time that I made the work. And now it's, I made this a year ago. I finally feel like this work has a place and it has its intention. And so the work is in a way driving the content rather than me, the artist driving, driving the work, which is kind of exciting and fun. So as I see all of the struggles and the rights that my mother and grandmother fought for, so I wouldn't have to live in a world where women were second class getting ripped away from us, I now feel like this particular, this particular body of work, this series has its place in the world. And I see myself as a part of this fight now in a way that is tangible rather than just thinking and sitting um, and feeling angry, I know that I have a way that I can 
contribute to this fight using my voice. And I feel like I owe it to future generations of women, girls, and people um, to use my body and my art practice and the voice that has awakened through this process of becoming an artist to fight this fight. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's wonderful to see what you've been doing. I haven't seen some of this, um, some of the work from your MFA and things like that. And all. this is so amazing to see what you're doing. Um, this particular series is just so touching to me in some ways. And it's, it's beautiful in the stark, like red and white type color, but at the same time, very um, unsettling almost. And I, I really enjoy that response. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Kelly? Kelly, I have a question about that last series that you were just showing about um, Grand's lipstick. Um, I'm wondering, you were talking a little bit, I was wondering if you could go a little further into the importance of the Polaroid. I know you said that it's sort of like the poor man's image, but um, for me growing up, Polaroids were so expensive to, to refill. And I remember my parents always like, no, we can't take a Polaroid of that. It's too expensive. Or, um, and I, so I'm wondering if you can go a little further into that. Well, I was trying to think about, that's a really good question. And it's funny because we never had a Polaroid because of that very reason. It was mm -hmm. not something that was accessible to us, but now it feels like it's this thing that's really like trendy and fun and almost disposable. Mm -hmm. um, and I was interested in Polaroid because of the inability to control the image itself. You don't get to really see what you're doing. You just have to trust what's going to come out. Mm -hmm. um, and unlike our you know, ability to manipulate and control images with our phones or our DSLR cameras, um, it's funny how you know now having a a DSLR camera is quite cost prohibitive and you can get this little Polaroid for maybe like the Polaroid camera for, you know, a couple hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. um, but yet to your point, like the image itself, the film is quite expensive and you have a, a camera or a phone and you just have instant image. Mm -hmm. So it was very interested in um, that sort of like loss of control and then the image quality itself. Be, I love the grainy texture, but I am... I hadn't considered until you brought it up that a Polaroid was actually some sort, it was almost like a, it could be considered like a symbol of class and status. Yeah. It was had. currency, it seemed like. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think that's really interesting. And it's also interesting to think of it too as this as this sort of token you know a polaroid image is this thing that you get to possess and it's instant um and thinking about now how we use cameras and photography to manipulate situations to present what we want and you sort of lose that when you're you know you're working with a polaroid That's a really, that was a really interesting conversation. I remember even whenever I was growing up, I like to take pictures of things and not people. And my family kept taking the camera away from me, like on vacations. They're like, there's only so much film. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay. Michelle said, your work is fascinating. Do you plan to continue with variety of media and performance work or back to painting? I'm still doing, um, I still do a lot of painting just on, it, it's not on the side, it's all part of the greater practice, um, but I, I do that really for enjoyment, and then I'm going to continue working with um, this, the mixed media to explore concept, um, and right now I am, you know, my, my work outside of my art practice is very, very labor and time intensive. And so I'm having to work in small, little small chunks. And so um, like the size and scale and medium is changing a little bit, but I hope now that I've 
ventured into the performance realm, I would like to continue to con keep considering how like the body can be a part of my practice. Sorry, my technology is acting up now. <laughs> um, Amy said, thank you, Kelly, for sharing your personal and artistic journey. I love your newest work, reliving the experience of drawing on your body with your grandmother's lipstick. This connects to a network of women performance artists that use their own body as the subject. Anna Mendiata, Janine and Tony, and Sally Brown, who is in Awakening and Pure. That is, that's, it, it, yeah. <laughs> I love that you ventured into this. It's such a different, it is a very different um, thing than anything I had seen you do before, but um, there's so much vulnerability in that. And it really is a beautiful thing to see. It's thank yeah. You. I love this series so much. Thank you. And thank you, Amy, for putting me in that really, really good company. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> it's, it's fitting and you deserve it okay. Alexandra says I, that she agrees with Amy so <laughs> that's wonderful can does I, anyone else have any can I have a, can I ask a question mm -hmm. um yeah I found it really powerful how you used quite innocuous things like the tax um to sort of um to convey you know wh when I heard the story behind that it may be kind of Oh, you know what I mean? But if you just looked at them, they just look very, you know, mundane and every day. So well, well done on that. Yeah, I really liked it. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? I just have, I just have a last question about, because I'm so intrigued by this last series that you shared. Um, I, um, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I find I'm I'm really drawn to objects um, of generations before. So the idea of using the lipstick that belonged to your grandmother is really appealing to me. Um, I'm just wondering in this um, performance that you're capturing through Polaroid, at what point did you decide that the performance was done? Well, I have, I, I do have a video of it and I'm working and I was, trying to think about like, okay, I'm, I'm doing this thing. I'm, I'm like, I'm trying this, this thing I've never done before. And what's interesting is that the video is much less powerful, um, than the Polaroid, than the still images, which I was not expecting. Um, but when I was actually doing it, it took about, I think 15 minutes total for the performance. And the to answer quite literally it was when the lipstick ran out okay ran out <laughs> that's fair, fair enough like, okay what else can I do like rolled around on the sheet a little bit and was like okay I guess it's done <laughs> there's something really powerful in that as well though I, that's really interesting that was an excellent question thank you Christiana all right well if no one else has any questions or comments then uh, we'll go ahead and move forward. But thank you so much, Kelly. It's so wonderful to have you back. It's so wonderful to have your new work in the gallery. And uh, thank you, Katie. Let's see what you've been doing. All right. Our last artist today, we have Christiana Eptograf. And I'm very excited to get to know you more, Christiana. You're new to our gallery, I believe. Yeah. All right. I'm going to read your bio and then I'll hand it over to you. Christiana E. Graph, a cross-discipline three-dimensional artist, was born in 1979. She completed her MFA at San Diego State University in 2011. She also received her BFA in 2007. Christiana has maintained her studio in Los Angeles for the last 12 years. She has been creating and exhibiting work nationwide, as well as teaching fine art and higher education in Southern California. All right, I'm going to hand it over to you. Great. Okay, so bear with me through the screen share. Even though I've done this for years through Zoom, I still can't quite get used to it. Okay, so, um, so thanks everybody for being here. My name again is Christiana Uptograph, um, and I'm based in Southern California. 
Uh, the work I'm focusing on at the moment is informed by feminism, motherhood, uh, keeping up appearances, domesticity, and identity. Uh, I started working on these concepts around 2015 while undergoing infertility treatments after a series of pregnancy losses. During this time, I was still very much involved in jewelry and metalsmithing, which is where my MFA is from. Um, what, and I was also um, highly involved in uh, material studies and in investigating its use and hybridization of these materials to rid it of perceived value. I was uh, focusing on images uh, and issues of corporal deterioration, um, body as betrayal, loss, and identity. Um, I began exploring uh, forming stainless steel mesh and um, pairing it with vitreous enamel, which becomes an incredibly fragile surface, although it can also be quite translucent at times. Um, during the making of this series of brooches called Null, um, it uh, informed a larger work of mine called Amphibolic. This is a wearable piece, um, hangs um, basically uterus level. <laughs> I was interested in the body as splitting, decaying, and breaking free to see obscured interiors. Um, in the backside of this piece, um, to the right, um, is a microscopic view of the endometrial lining of the uterus. Um, while working on these small, very fussy pieces, I was also working on a larger wall series with silicone impregnated silk. Um, this first piece, vacuous, I slumped this fabric using extreme pressure during the curing process, creating a saggy vacancy. I paired this translucent skin with um, illegible words hoping the viewer would connect to the body and its personal edifice. Working on this scale and these materials uh, became much more engaging to me. And I started to think again about connecting my work to the physical space that the body inhabits. Um, I started this piece just after having my daughter in 2017. Um, which was a larger piece of the previous week work that you just saw uh, called vacuous. In this piece, I was thinking about the transformation of the body and the void that exists after a pregnancy occurs. Um, I paired this large piece. It's about eight feet by four feet by six feet. Um, I paired it with the hair that had fallen during my um, postpartum hair loss. Um, this work is attached to the wall, which is a natural vertical for me in, in order to give it a home. It was my hope that when viewing this work, the viewer would have to carefully navigate the trail of hair in order to view the details within the piece. Uh, this work informed the next work called First, where I used extreme weight again um, and water to manipulate the fibers of a baby blanket. This is actually my best friend <laughs> growing up. Um, and it was my baby blanket. Um, I was particularly interested in showing the physical void behind a bulging and splitting um, form. I also used some hair to stitch this piece. Um, I was also simultaneously working, this was um, during COVID lockdown and I was, I was working on a lot of things um, all at once. Um, but I was thinking about the, um, pieces and working on pieces that were examining the tethering of the body to other bodies. Um, I had just had my son um, prior to this piece and um, he was a newborn when COVID hit. Um, and I was thinking about um, his sort of complicated birth, the complications that we had with nursing and um, being in the NICU uh, and my body carrying his. and and this sort of breaking open of skin to reveal all of these complexities of, of bodies to bodies. And um, I was also using, if you can see down in the lower right, these tiny, teeny tiny uh, glass beads. Um, and it's, it, they're, not, um, they're not pierced, they're just little um, rounds and um, to represent a human ovum. 
Um, this piece, which you've seen in the exhibition, I, I started to slowly transition to using more objects of domesticity in my work in conjunction with notions of tethering the body um, as seen in this piece right there. So here are some details. This gave way um, to taking these objects of domesticity and freezing their impressions in, in time uh, with cement and plaster. During these works, we were deep into the time of lockdown. I had two kids under the age of three in the house. My teaching had moved entirely online and my interaction with other artists um, had also moved entirely online. So the only physical life I was living was one inside of the home. Um, I became increasingly more resentful of the minutia of the home. Uh, my role as a stay-at-home mother that I felt like I had succumbed to. Um, and some of this work deals with uh, prescribed gender norms, uh, the entanglement of the home, family, career, and also referencing my own personal memories. And today's societies, uh, you know, society's chauvinist sort of zeitgeist. Um, I began to investigate how social norms and expectations can shape us. My body of work became fairly prolific over the course of the COVID years um, with concepts relating to the body as life and decay. So for, you know, further investigating those the ideas of um, body as decay and also life, fear of stagnation, which was huge for me, emptiness and personal identity. Um, these next few images are on works on paper. Um, I began working more intensely with these voids um, and how they existed in a variety of materials uh, such as ultra cal, um, paper, fabric, and also wax. Um, these next four images are works on paper taking impressions of the objects with pressure and wetting the paper. I then used glass bead, that same glass bead, in resistance to the ink and graphite that I was using to make these marks on the paper. So in some places you can see where the glass bead has lifted off of the surface and there's like a little, a little donut, you know, like a little, a little cell that opens up. Um, and then this is also just ink, um, but with an impression. Um, and then I was starting to think about these as uh, works in, you know, still again, frozen in time um, and, and then this loss of touch that was happening. I, my mother suddenly became totally inaccessible during COVID. Um, she's clear across the country and wasn't able to get to her. And then the moments that we finally were, you know, and that impression uh, leaving that um, in our relationship and then also how that could bleed into my my own um, raising of my own children. Um, recently, this spring, I was I was uh, invited to um, be an artist in residence at a community gallery in San Diego called Art Produce uh, for five weeks with a solo exhibition at the termination of my project. I focused on a site-specific installation of impressions. So you can kind of see these uh, domestic objects here that I'm kind of laying out. Um, so I was using all objects of domesticity, all of which were donated by local caregivers. It's a little hanger, meat tenderizer, spatula, or I guess it's still a spatula at that point, right? Um, so while much of this work was certainly about the notion of motherhood and domesticity, it also involved all caretakers from every walk of life. Um, this is the largest piece in the, in the exhibition. So this is the broom from our household. I didn't realize that this was my husband's favorite broom, <laughs> but I destroyed it, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> um, um, this work examined the minutia of caretaking again, but through the repetition of linear pieces, you can kind of see off to the, to the left there that went across the floor and up the wall. I'll play this little video for you. Oops, there we go. 
So with pieces and details reaching beyond the, the viewer site, I was hoping that the endless tasks of daily life at home and the loss of self and servitude to others would be present in these voids. I'll just go back, Let's see if I can go back one and play it again. Um, by placing the work directly on the ground, I was requiring the viewer to step cautiously over the work to make it a little bit more vulnerable, uh, small and harder to connect with. The viewer may have had to crouch to see the work more clearly, causing some uncertainty and discomfort. Uh, during this show, Roe v. Wade was overturned. Um, while it wasn't surprising, it was definitely, uh, oops, see if I can get out of this. There we go. Um, while it wasn't surprising to have Roe v. Wade overturned, it was, um, it was gut-wrenching. Um, I made this piece Good Measure, which is also in the exhibition, uh, as an act of resistance using handmade paper pulp that I rolled out onto the ground. Um, I lay an oxidizing coat hanger inside of the paper pulp to, to take an impression of that object. Uh, and I kept it wet for a little more than a week so that the oxidation would seep through to the backside so that it could be viewed on, on both sides, sort of a sculptural work, but something that you could see in the round. Um, I also, I also made this work so that my daughter, I can photograph my daughter with the work. Um, she's five years old. She, um, she, she has sort of a, a tie politically um, to, to us, you know, here in the States. And uh, when she was conceived, she was conceived on the night of the election in 2016. We found out that she was a girl just before the women's rights uh, March in LA in January of um, 2017. So um, her existence and being a girl, I think, um, has been a huge, had a huge impact on me as a as a woman. Um, so I've made this piece partially um, to mourn the rights that she was born with, um, but also to remind myself that she needs a mother who will fight for her rights and who will not allow the ruling. This ruling to um, to place her or her peers um, and their futures in jeopardy. Um, <laughs> so that that is my uh, latest body of work. Um, that's the last piece that I've made. It was just completed maybe about four weeks ago. Um, so thanks everybody for walking through this with me. Thank you, Christiana. That was wonderful. You did amazing things in that residency. You said it was a five week. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. I, I think I, I think I completed something insane, like 70 pieces. I mean, um, I was very nervous that I was not going to have enough to fill the gallery. So I sort of front loaded it with work. <laughs> Love that. Does anyone have any questions or comments? We have one from Amy that said, thank you, Christiana, for sharing your work produced during the COVID years, experience of being home, making artworks using domestic objects in the sculptures. I was thinking about Mimi Smith's sculptures made of thread, measuring all the rooms in her house made while she was at home with her young children. Mm -hmm. um, and also she asked if you've ever seen Martha Rosler's video, Semiotics of the Kitchen. I have seen that video, yes, actually. Um friend who recommended that I see that. I, I looked at that work, um, I think just before the residency started. That's awesome. Sorry, my phone just started going off. But um, technology is not on my side today. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I really loved seeing that. I think it's something that 
probably many, many of the women here and the women in in across the world really can um, experience during um, during the pandemic uh, what it meant to be a wife and a mother and a caregiver and um, it everything sort of changed in a lot of ways um, and I think that a lot of the art that was done during that time period having it now and it's it's very interesting that you have those pieces sort of like in cement to me that is that's that's saying so much because having that um the physical reminder of what that means I think is very important to us and these pieces almost like artifacts and that's 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 really fascinating to me does anyone else have any questions Michelle said do you think your work will shift with the slight easing of the pandemic era uh, no, I'm still in the, in the doldrums of, of small childrenhood. Um, and it's so much about, um, about them right now and my connection to them. And, and definitely, you know, maternal ambivalence is something that I feel so, so deeply. It's pervasive right now. Um, I, my work is shifting. I don't know where it's headed next, but I, I'm certain the material or the topics will be similar. That's awesome. That was an awesome question. All right. Well, does anyone else? Oh, go ahead, Kelly. So I was just wondering if you have um, spent any time with Rachel White Reed's work, um, like the way that she uses, um, neg you know, like really uses negative space to inform the the pieces that she makes. It, I just felt like an immediate connection to that, and then also. Um, some of the recent work by Patty Chang um, on motherhood. No, I haven't seen Patty's work. I, I, I'll, I'll look that up. Um, go ahead. I was just gonna say, everyone needs to see Patty Chang's, uh, Patty Chang's work, Melons, just because, but the okay. recent work on um, We Are All Mothers. Yeah, I think you might like that. That's a great suggestion. I'll, I'll check that out. Rachel Wright, White Reed, I haven't really, I haven't really spent a whole lot of time with her work. Um, is, was she using a lot of imp impressions of the work that you're talking about? Well, she she uses negative space. Like she actually like creates architectures based on the air of space that that mm -hmm. like within a space. But then mm -hmm. there also she um, creates like she creates objects based on the interior of domestic objects like I'm just thinking of their um she's made pieces um out of like the space inside of a of a hot water bottle mm -hmm. heat bed and things like that and I just I just made that correlation between the domestic objects and the impressions and then mm -hmm. the way she used negative space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it's uh I don't know I think it's a, a cool cool to see these things um repeated in different ways not repeated but you know just explored in different ways thematically um it's just exciting yeah thanks i i'm really i think i've been dealing with the um, with impressions and or like um the exterior and then show being able to show like an interior i like the duality of interior and exterior and then showing that absence and presence in the with with using those domestic items even even in paper, just simply slumping the, the um, paper that I, uh, it's, you know, sheet paper that I was slumping, but um, I'm really, really interested in, in that duality. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Go ahead, Melanie. I was, um, I was looking at your your residency, some of the pieces there. And I wondered, there was a piece on the on my right hand side. It, it looked, it was like a, it looked, I thought it looked like a presenter, but I don't know. <laughs> it oh. was kind of like a dome with it. And I just wondered if you could explain, um, you know, a little bit about that piece. Um, yeah, the um, that was something that um, that I made during a time when I was nursing my son and uh, you know it's interesting that you say it looked like placenta I've heard that before and that's not what I was thinking I was actually thinking about this like 
beautiful child who was insatiable, like could never get enough. And I was the, sh- the, the other side of it was a, sh- you know, shriveling breast, like this just, <laughs> oh, yeah. it was just going to like shrivel and die. And I, and then it feeding this like hungry, red, purple, beautiful, you know, small thing that also had this like sort of griminess to it, which was to me like the greed, you know, and like never being, he, my, I have, my son was very, very large baby. Um, so he, he just seemed um, like he could never get enough. I could never give him enough. Um, you know, again, like cutting that cord could, it, you know, it would, it would be great to, to cut the cord and, and breathe some life back, di- back into this deflated breast, <laughs> you know. That's really poignant. Also, whenever you're, I know whenever I was breastfeeding my daughter, I've never been so hungry. As yeah. I was. Like, it takes so much what out of you. It's a trap. It's a trap. <laughs> yeah. And I'm um, very thankful for that time period, but at the same time, I look back at it with that very mixed emotions. And um, I love to hear that that's what that piece was about. That's, that's really fascinating. Do we have any other questions or comments for Christiana? Well, thank you so much. This was absolutely wonderful to see the rest of your body of work besides the pieces that we have in the show as well. And um, I love that they are part of the show and I'm excited to see what you do next. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Those of you who are here and also those of you who will be seeing it later on YouTube. It'll be going up in the next few days. And um, yeah, this is this has absolutely been wonderful. Thank you so much, all three of these artists who were here today for sharing yourself and your vulnerability and your the amazing things that you're saying in your artwork. All of these pieces are so integral to what this show has become. And um, I'm really excited to have you here. All right, well, Thank you to everyone, um, and I'll see you all next time. All right. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Bye.